Hello everybody, this is our first screencast lecture for 6th graders. What I would expect you to be able to do is, while you're watching this video, is to be taking notes just like you would do in science class. And where you see stars especially, those are the things that you must write down. And of course you can write more if you wish, but those are that's the minimal, that's what you really need to make sure that you have down. And also, if you miss something, obviously you should pause it, rewind it, take your time, go at your own pace. So this should hopefully be something that works out real well. And when I check your notes, one thing I should hope to be able to get from you is some feedback on what we can do better and how this could help you learn even better in the future. So today's lecture topic is going to be measuring volume. The picture you see here are kids filling up uh, into a phone booth. and one of the things, this is something that goes back, I don't know, probably to the 1950s for some reason in colleges and things like that. It was a really popular activity to do. is to see how many total people you can get to jam into a phone booth. And here's one that's a similar idea, trying to get as many kids in a uh, car as possible. Now, the people obviously would find that there would come a point where you cannot fit any more people in the car or any more people in the phone booth. And that's because people take up space. People have volume. And here you can see a definition for volume. This is one thing I want you to write down right here. Volume is defined as the amount of space an object occupies. Now, you could figure out volume in many different ways. Now, today we're going to talk about uh, rectangular solids. So here's one you could probably be able to figure out. How many total blocks are located in this stack. Now you can pause it here to figure it out or you can just move on and get the answer. Now each layer has 12 bricks so you can see 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this layer has a total of 12 bricks. There are three layers of bricks. 1, 2, 3. So we'd have 12 here, 12 in this layer, and 12 in this layer. And so that's a total of 36 bricks because 12 plus 12 plus 12 is 36 or 12 times 3 is 36. Now imagine you're getting ready to take a bath. Now hopefully you guys take a bath on occasion and if you fill the bathtub up to the rim, so let's imagine you have the water filled all the way up to the very top. Now your bathtub really shouldn't be able to do that because there should be a spillover drain. But let's say that's plugged up or you don't have that and the tub is filled completely up to the rim with water and then you climb in. What's going to happen? Well, the water takes up space. You take up space. And when you climb into the tub, you're going to push that water out of the way. That's going to make the water overflow over the tub sides. This is called water displacement. So the water is being displaced. The water is being pushed out of the way. Here's a definition. Here's a definition. The water displacement method of measuring volume is the amount of water that is moved by the solid object that's equal to the volume of the solid object. So if the object takes up 100 milliliters of space, 100 milliliters of volume, it's going to move 100 milliliters of water out of the tub or out of the container. Now here's a question for you. What if two people have the same body weight? Will they have the same volume? So you can imagine two people, let's say they both weigh 120 pounds. Are they both going to have the same volume? Will they both take up the same amount of space? This brings us to the idea of body fat. And you may have had this done for you where you would uh, check to see your percentage of body fat. And one way to do this would be to use this uh, pinch method where the, and the more you can pinch, the more fat or more uh, larger percentage of body fat you have. Now, there's a better way to do this. Now, there's a better way to figure out your percentage of body fat than just pinching. Now, you can get a much more accurate reading. Now, to be able to do that, you have to understand a couple concepts here about volume. Now, if you take a look at this picture, you will see both of these. This is a section of fat, and on the on your right side is a sample of muscle tissue. Both of those samples have a total weight of five pounds. However, do they both take up the same amount of space? Do they both have the same volume? No, you can clearly see that the fat takes up much more space 
almost three times as much space as the muscle does, but it's the same weight. An equal volume of muscle is going to weigh more than the same volume of fat. So if you have this much muscle and you have this, this much fat, the muscle is going to weigh almost three times more than the fat. So this could weigh three pounds. This could be three pounds of muscle. And this could be one pound of fat, even though they take up the same amount of space. Muscle is going to be considered to be more dense. And we'll talk about more, we'll talk about density in a future unit. And fat is less dense. It takes up more space for the same amount of weight. This is pretty neat. This is called hydrostatic weighing. And that you can do hydrostatic weighing to figure out your body fat percentage. And the idea behind this is that you sit on a scale. Now, let's say the water wasn't here. If you sit on a scale, let's say you weigh, would weigh 200 pounds. But when you're underwater, and I'm sure you've noticed this, you have this buoyant force on you where it's easier for you to lift things. Uh, everything feels a lot lighter when it's underwater. A person will still weigh something underwater. They're going to weigh less. Now, the thing is, is that what we were just talking about, fat floats better than muscle. So if this person weighs 200 pounds, another person weighs 200 pounds, sits on the same scale in the same tub of water, the person with a higher percent of body fat is actually going to weigh less than the person with more muscle and less percent body fat because the fat is going to float more, which is going to make the body weigh less underwater. That's pretty clever. Now let's think about volume and what are some of the things that we measure volume of. Uh, another good way to think about that would be if you go to the store, what are some products that we purchase by volume? Drinks are a really common example of items that you would buy by volume. So we'd go to the store and say, hey, I would like to buy eight and a half pounds of milk. You would go and buy a gallon of milk, Coke, soda pop, things like that. So if you take a look at the label of a Coke can, you will see that it's measured in 12 fluid ounces or 355 milliliters. Both of those are units of volume. Gasoline. Gasoline is another example of things that you buy by volume. See right here, you see that this is, uh, the measurement is gallons, so you pay per gallon. Uh, motor oil would be another example. And motor oil is purchased, again, by volume. So here it's one quart or a quarter gallon or 946 milliliters. Liquid medicine, like uh, it, cough syrups, um, some antibiotics could be in liquid form, especially for children's medicine because they have a hard time swallowing pills. So liquid medicines are going to be commonly purchased by volume. Here's uh, NyQuil, some sort of cough medicine, and here again you'll see the units of measurement, the volume, six fluid ounces or 177 milliliters back of those three products, what did all of those three products have in common? All right, have you figured it out? What have you come up with? One answer to that question is that all three of those products, what they have in common is that they are all liquids. However, it does not have to be in a liquid to be sold by volume. There are some products that can be sold by volume that are solids. Uh, here's a couple examples. One and another product that is solid and sold by volume is this. This is firewood. Now think for a minute, see if anybody knows the unit that firewood is sold in. That is called the cord, C-O-R-D. You don't need to know that, but uh, knowing that firewood is sold by volume, that would be something that I would expect you to know. Now here you see several different units of volume measure. And many of these you may be familiar with, like the teaspoon and tablespoon. You're often going to see that in the kitchen. The cup, pint, quart, gallon, probably definitely have heard of those before. And several more maybe you're not familiar with at all, like the peck or the bushel. And However, the SI unit of volume, this is the one that I'm going to expect you to know, is the liter, L-I-T-E-R. Now, a liter is 
roughly a quarter of a gallon. It's a little bit more than a quarter of a gallon. And a milliliter is one thousandth. <laughs> one thousandth. If you remember the prefixes from before, so the prefix milli means one thousandth. It's one thousandth of a liter. That means that there are one thousand milliliters in every liter. So it's not very much. A cubic centimeter is the exact same amount as a milliliter. Now a cubic centimeter, if you can imagine, would be a cube that's one centimeter on each side. So it's going to be about that much of liquid. I mean, it's a very, very tiny amount of liquid. So one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter is a cubic centimeter. And it can be abbreviated in two different ways, either centimeters cubed, like this, or CC. And you're often going to hear the abbreviation CCs, in, especially like in hospital or doctor shows, like they'll say, hey, I need 350 CCs of this stat. You know, that it's CCs, they're 350 milliliters of the medicine or whatever it is. Or you may hear it with uh, motorcycles or mechanics where they'll talk about a uh, 50 cc engine. Like in Mario Kart, uh, they have the different speeds and like the 50 cc engines. I think they have 100 cc, 150 cc engines in Mario Kart. Here's a video clip about metric units of volume. Volume is the measure of space inside something like a carton or a bottle. This bottle of water has a volume of one liter. A liter is the basic unit of volume in the metric system, abbreviated as L. Each liter contains 1,000 milliliters. Milliliters are used to measure smaller amounts of liquid. One milliliter fits into this little eyedropper. Milliliters are small enough to be very precise measures. This is why medicine is often measured in milliliters. This nutrition label for tomato soup lists one serving of soup as 240 milliliters. 240 milliliters of tomato soup looks like this. On the other extreme, very large volume can be visualized by looking at a hot air balloon. The average hot air balloon has a volume of 2,550,000 liters of air. Now let's talk about calculating volume. So how is volume calculated? Especially today we're going to talk about with three-dimensional solids. Now a three-dimensional rectangular solid, something like a cereal box, a brick, those are all rectangular solids. They have a length, they have a width, they have a height, and those three dimensions are going to be the same everywhere. Here you see a rectangle, a three-dimensional solid. It has a height of 20 centimeters, it has a length of 8 centimeters, and has a width of 4 centimeters. We would use the formula, and you probably have uh, come across this in your math class, that the formula for volume is length times width times height. So here we see the numbers 20 times 8 times 4 and you could just type those in. Use your calculator. I strongly recommend using your calculator to do these things. 20 times 8 times 4 and that equals 640. So the volume here of this rectangular solid is 640 and the unit is cubic centimeters because it's cm it's centimeters times centimeters times centimeters anything times itself three times is cubed so it's cubic centimeters with the dimensions 20 centimeters 8 centimeters and 2 centimeters and so we're going to type in 20 times 8 times 2 okay so our final answer is 320 cubic centimeters. Now here's another one. Here's another rectangular solid. This dimension is 25 centimeters. This dimension is 4 centimeters. And this dimension is 3 centimeters. Let's do the calculations. 25 times 4. 25 times 4 you could probably do in your head. That's 100. 
and then we're going to multiply that by 3. So 100 times 3 is 300. Okay, so now our unit's going to be centimeter times centimeter times centimeter again. So our final answer is 300 centimeters cubed. Now, more commonly than measuring the volume of a rectangular solid is going to be measuring the volume of a liquid. And to measure the volume of a liquid, we're going to use the tool, the graduated cylinder. You may also call this just a graduate. I tend to just call it a graduate, a graduated cylinder. The reason why it's called a graduated cylinder is, first of all, because it's a cylinder. And second of all, it has gradations. That's why it's called a graduate. It has gradations. These are the markings on the cylinder for use for measurements. And most graduated cylinders you're going to come across, at least in the science lab, are going to be marked off in milliliters. Now, when you're using a graduated cylinder to measure liquid, you are going to find that after you pour the liquid in, the liquid is not going to just lay flat at the surface. And especially when you use water, what's going to happen is you're going to see a curvature. And that curvature, that curved, surf, curved surface of the liquid in the graduated cylinder, that's known as the meniscus, the meniscus. And here I kind of have a drawing of it. This is over-exaggerated. But you're going to see that on the meniscus, the level of the liquid, of the water in this case, is going to actually be curved. And what you're going to want to do is measure the bottom of the meniscus. And so you're going to look right here. That's going to be the correct measurement. So when you read at the bottom of the meniscus, right here, what do you think that is? Five milliliters from here to here. So this is going to be five, this will be six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is going to be eleven and then one half. So this would be eleven and one half milliliters. When you read the graduated cylinder, it's real important that you get level, put your eye level with that bottom of the meniscus. That way, you will be able to read it as accurately as possible. So in this case, you have 20 milliliters here. This is 25. This is 30. There's 10 milliliters from 20 to 30. So 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. Just a little bit more than 36 milliliters would be the correct reading for this one. Look at the bottom, the bottom, the bottom, the bottom of the meniscus, the meniscus, the meniscus. You can see a curve at the top of the liquid. Its shape is concave and not straight. There's a reason it's curved, it's because, it's because the liquid's molecules, the molecules have a very strong attraction. The sides of the cylinder, so the surface is curved downward. That's the spot you look at. The meniscus, the meniscus, the meniscus. Look at the bottom, the bottom, the bottom, the bottom, the meniscus, the meniscus, the meniscus. The bottom, the meniscus, the meniscus, the meniscus. Your measurements on the right way. Look at the bottom of the shape that's concave. You'll be so precise when you measure liquids. Okay, everybody, thanks for listening. Hopefully, everything went well. If you have any questions, be sure you ask. If you want to ask questions in the comments below, that's fine, and I'll respond to them as quickly as possible. That's a pretty good way to ask questions because then other people will be able to see the answer response to it as well. What do you say, bud? Careful, kids. Bye. Oh, yeah. Bye. Come on.